Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Everybody have a good New Year's? Yeah, I spent it with a bunch of teenagers at Liberty University for Winterfest. Uh, it's about 10,000 kids there, and I'm tired. Yeah. But, uh, hey, God is good. It's a brand new year. It's 2015. We're excited. We're excited that you're here this morning. And uh, let's all stand and sing the song, My Lighthouse.
Good morning. Thanks for singing. We could hear you up here and you sounded great. Now let's turn and look at our neighbors and say you sounded great. Happy New Year. God bless you. Good morning. So um, we're so excited this morning uh, to have Gabri back with us. Um, she's the barefoot one up here playing the fiddle. And um, this is her only Sunday that she's going to be here with us. She got a job back in Williamsburg uh, working at a museum. What museum is it? The Witt House Museum. Okay. So if you want to see her, you can see her at the Witt House Museum. Um, but y'all show her some love as she's uh, heading out this morning. And uh, let's continue our worship and sing 10,000 Reasons. Sing like 
time has come, still my soul will sing your praise on Come on. Ten thousand reasons and forevermore, forevermore. the Lord of my soul. Father, that's why we're here this morning, is to worship you. Lord, to worship you with everything that we have. Uh, Lord, with all that we are. And Father, as you've given us so many reasons to be thankful. You've given us so many reasons to praise you. Father, we say thank you. Uh, Lord, thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's his name that we celebrate this morning together. In one voice, in one heart, in one spirit. We worship you, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Is the Lamb who 
was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you you so much this morning God thank you just for the energy that you supplied us to wake us up Lord to allow us to um, have the opportunity to join together with friends and family at Hickory Ridge just for the purpose of worshiping you Lord you are worthy so worthy and Father we thank you this morning for song Lord we thank you for your word 
Father, we thank you for a new year. And as we get ready to open up your message for us this morning, and as you guide us into a new year, uh, Father, we pray that you would be with our pastor. God, we thank you so much for him. Lord, thank you for his spirit of love and kindness, God, that you've blessed him with. And Lord, we just pray that as you speak through him this morning, God, as you bring us a message of hope for the new year, God, help us to listen. Help us to understand. Lord, help us to be open to you in 2015. Lord, 2014 was amazing. And Lord, as great as it was, we know that you are even greater. And Lord, we know that 2015 will be a year of blessing, a year of encouragement, a year of service in your name. And Father, we thank you for that. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And together we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I don't think I realize how hard marriage is going to be. Every marriage goes through good times and bad times. I was pretty sure we weren't going to make it. We've been very happy. We just want to stay that way. Family Life's Weekend to Remember is a fun, romantic weekend getaway for you and your spouse to learn practical tools and God's blueprint for a successful marriage. For decades, more than a million couples have attended a weekend to remember, and 96% agreed it had a positive impact on their marriage. The weekend taught us ways to communicate that we didn't even think were possible. It took our communication to the next level. The Weekend to Remember gives you tools that you didn't even know you need. It gave us a chance to relax and reconnect. We got a little sizzle going too. <laughs> Get away from your busy life, shut down the cell phones, and work together to build a step-by-step -step plan for a better future together. Choose from more than 70 events across the country, destinations that are truly a getaway. Register today and reinvest in yourselves and your marriage. It worked for us. We think every couple should attend a Weekend to Remember. This saved us. Go to WeekendToRemember.com or call 1-800-FL-TODAY to learn more. Your marriage is worth it. Okay, hey, Happy New Year, New Year everybody. Everybody happy to be here this morning? Yes, yes, you guys look a little tired today. So I think we ought to begin by doing some calisthenics, right? And uh, Alan, you want to lead us in some jumping jacks, right, to get us going this morning? And uh, welcome to you all. So good to have you here uh, as we celebrate uh, the new year. And uh, at the end of the service today, I've got three promises I'm going to make to you, okay? And uh, so stay awake for the whole message. Uh, the three promises we'll be giving at the end, and uh, hopefully by then you'll still be engaged and uh, still be with us by then. And uh, I want to tell you about a couple things, okay? Uh, number one, if you'd like to go to the marriage conference, there is information in the bulletin, and I just saw the video clip for it, and I encourage you to come. It's local at the Founders Inn, and so sign up for the marriage conference. You can go online to do that. If you're military, you go free. And if you want to stay there, they have a special rate at Founders Inn. Uh, if you want to spend a the night there, you can. Uh, so take care of that. If you haven't signed up to have your picture taken, all right, today's the last day to do that. We start taking pictures this week. I think Tuesday uh, we start. And I need you to sign up. Even if you don't want to buy any pictures, there's no obligation to buy pictures. But if you don't get your picture taken, you won't be in the directory, all right? So I want to encourage you uh, to sign up. You get a free 8x10 uh, just for coming to sign up and just to have your family uh, picture taken. Uh, you can bring your, your pet with you if you want. I know some of you that means a lot. Uh, I'm not taking my picture if my dog can't be in it. And uh, so uh, anyway, you can bring your pet, and uh, we'll put him in the directory or her in the directory too. And so uh, we're looking forward to having all of you take your picture uh, so that we know who everybody is, okay? If you're a guest this morning, thanks for being with us, and uh, I I hope that you take just a minute. There's a little flap on the bulletin. If you can fill that out, it tears right off, and then drop that into your offering plate at the end of the service. We certainly would appreciate that. And then if you have taken one of the baby bottles, uh, that was kind of our, one of our Christmas projects this year. Uh, you're supposed to fill it up with change and uh, maybe put some green stuff in there and uh, fill it up, right, and then bring it back to us. If you have taken one and haven't got it back to us, please try to take care of that this week so we can get those all turned in, okay? 
Well, I really missed uh, being with you all last week, but I did check in online, and uh, everything that Rick said uh, can and will be used against him in the future. And uh, so, no, thanks, Rick. Did a great job. Uh, I enjoyed the message. I'm ready to sign up. I'm ready to serve in 2014, or 15, rather. And, uh, man, it was hard to write that 2015. You know, you're such a habit of writing 2014. Uh, but, man, good things are going to be happening, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you today about, Okay. And I know we got a lot of people who are battling uh, the flu, right? That's no good, uh, but we're going to pray it away, and uh, we're going to ask the Lord to keep us healthy uh, during this uh, flu season, and so pray for those who are battling uh, the flu. I hope it doesn't get your home. Uh, I am praying for Steve's mom. Uh, she's up at Chesapeake uh, Regional Hospital uh, battling pneumonia and the flu, so I'm praying for her and uh, praying for others that are sick. Uh, my son Tyler is on the way to the, uh, I, I think he's going to patient first uh, with issues with the flu, I believe, and so pray for Ty Man. And uh, my son Nathan is here somewhere, and uh, he's got a scarf that he wanted me to make sure that I announce that that's his scarf, not my scarf, and I don't know what that means, but uh, he's, uh, if you see a scarf, that says Liberty University on it. Nate said that is his, not mine, and so I can't mess with it. So uh, anyway, welcome uh, to Hickory Ridge Community Church. I'm so glad that you are here with us this morning, and I'm excited about a new year, okay? With New Year's comes a lot of new opportunities. Unfortunately, sometimes we carry the problems over from last year, and so I'm going to talk about where we're going as a church as we begin uh, this new year. So if you're a guest with us, hey, today's a great day for you to worship with us as we uh, look at what's going to happen in the future. And uh, that's where at the end of the message, uh, some things will be kind of wrapping it all together as to what we're going to be doing in this new year. Okay, but the whole theme, all right, is not me, but he. And uh, straight from God's word, and, and, and Jesus said, uh, and, and as you're looking at this thing, okay, as you look at where your life is and what God is doing in your life, you can be a powerful force for good in spreading the gospel if you will decrease and Christ increase. Okay, that, that's the key of, of being really used of God. And the problem that many of us have is that we're so full of ourselves, right, that we really can't empty ourselves enough for God to empower us. And so I'm going to talk about four things that we're going to emphasize in 2015 that I believe will help you to spread the gospel, will help you to be more powerful in your walk with Christ. And, and as you think about what God is doing, and you think about the opportunities and how God blesses people, th there is this blessability factor. And, and it has nothing to do with really the circumstances that you encounter. It has everything to do with how you respond to the circumstances that you are in. And so we're going to talk about that. Great people of God do things differently than just good people of God. And I want to challenge you, right, to take it to a whole new level, all right? I don't want you to be satisfied with status quo, okay? So we're going to, we're going to push you, okay? We're, we're going to drive you to be more like Christ in this upcoming year. Now, when we do this, you, you've got to realize some things, all right? The, the enemy is going to put more pressure on you, right, when you do this. But, but that's not a problem, we can make it a problem. That, that is only a problem if we are not prepared. And, and this is the key, right? So many times the enemy pushes against us and he gets us defeated, he gets us discouraged. R really, when the enemy comes against us, that should empower us, right? That should embolden us. Now, now think about it from the opposite standpoint, okay? Every one of us in this room battle with a spirit of a rebel. Every one of us. When you give in to that spirit of rebel right? And somebody who tries to talk you out of it comes along to you. What do you, what do, you do? You dig your heels in, right? You become more of a rebel. So I, you ain't going to tell me what to do. Why don't we take the inverse of that, right? In our walk with Christ. And when the enemy puts the pressure on us and says, well, woe is me. I guess I got to give up, right? I guess the pressure's too great. Why do we become such sissies when the enemy comes against us? That ought to embolden us and say, oh, no, you don't, Satan. You ain't going to get the best of me. I refuse to lay down and give up and fall into this woe is me sympathy card. It gets you nowhere. It gives you something to do, but it gets you absolutely nowhere. 
So four things we're going to emphasize in the upcoming year. Number one, we're going to be emphasizing gathering together. All right, gathering together. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus says these words, okay? He says, whosoever is not, is, whoever is not with me, right, is against me. And so too many people have brought into the wrong mindset when it comes to Christian life. They say, well, I'm just going to lay low. It's, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to lay low. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, it's okay, just lay low. He didn't say, hey, you're not doing good? Just lay low. How many Christians fall into that stupid thinking? I'm just going to lay low right now because things aren't going real good. Jesus said, if you're not going with me, if you're not going in the direction that I'm going, you may not have thought about this, but you're going against me. Take it up with Jesus if you don't like that, okay? This is not me talking. Jesus said, whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. What is he saying? He says, as we get together, we gather together. Not only we gather people with us, but we gather together. And so at the time that you least feel like gathering is the time that you most need to be gathered. Jesus is very clear in driving home this point. The enemy knows that most of us, it takes very little to get us discouraged. And as a result of that low level of strength that we have, low level of preparation that we have, any little thing sets us off track. So I want to challenge you, right, to gather together so that you can be strengthened and so that you can be a blessing to others. Now, now you're going to go against the tide, okay? You're going against the flow. This next uh, slide shows the front page of Newsweek, okay? And, and it says the Bible, right? It's a news new story, cover story for this year, January 2nd. And it says that the Bible is so misunderstood, it's a sin, begins this article, okay? And here's what the author said about Christians, okay? He says, they wave their Bibles at passerbys, screaming their commend commendations of homosexuals. They fall on their knees, worshiping at the base of granite monuments to the Ten Commandments while demanding prayer in school. They appeal to God to save America from political opponents, mostly Democrats. They gather in football stadiums by the thousands to pray for the country's salvation. They're God frauds, cafeteria Christians who pick and choose which Bible verses they heed and less care than they exercise in selecting side orders from their lunch. They are joined by religious rationalizers, fundamentalists too, unable to find scriptures supporting their basis and their biases of belief. They twist phrases and they modify translations to prove they are honoring God's word. Now, now this guy gives us a mouthful, right? A mouthful, really, of heresy. And, and he goes through the rest of the article, and he says, in essence, that Christians don't have enough sense about God's word to even defend it. And here we have this guy accusing us of being cafeteria Christians and that we pick and choose what we like. And then he goes through this article and picks and chooses one passage that he likes that Jesus said when Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, wait a minute, I thought that's what we did. I thought we pick and choose passages of Scripture that we like. As we look at this guy's presentation, my question is, why would Newsweek write an article, such heretical article, such an, a biased article? I, I thought Christians were the biased ones. In this article, there is no quote from anybody of validity. This is this guy just spewing off, right, dumping what he thinks his perspective, his view. One seminary professor decided to go against what this article said, and he says, the factual errors on this article are legion. It is extreme bias toward Christianity. It makes unsubstantial accusations against the followers of Christ, and all the while offers zero historical evidence backing up its claims. So, so this guy who writes this article has no theological training, no really understanding of Scripture, but decides that the greatest sin that we have as evangelical Christians 
is that we are misunderstanding the Bible. That's our biggest sin. As you look at where our culture is, the church is not considered central. It's not considered even on the outside of culture. Now the church is considered dangerous. And the reason I say this is because if we were just a bunch of lunatics, they wouldn't have to come against us so ferociously. I remember several years ago I said, if Christians are so powerful, why is nobody wanting to kill us? Now we are living in a day and age where, yes, people are wanting to kill us because they look at our faith as something that is dangerous. We are no longer just marginal within society. We are now considered dangerous. One author said, religion poisons everything. As you look at this article that was written in Newsweek, it really is not an attack on the Bible or Christianity, but rather it is an attack against the moral standards on which our faith stands. And so our job is to be prepared. And so when we think about gathering together, Paul was very specific when he said, don't forsake this. As we gather together, it is to encourage one another. And when we go out, we're entering into, into the mission field. When we don't gather together, we become discouraged, we become defeated, we become critical and cynical. We, we can't help but go that way because we are not getting together with the support of other believers. In 1 Peter chapter 3, I don't think this is in your notes, but this is a bonus verse for you this morning. Paul says this, or Peter says this rather, you are blessed. He doesn't just say you're blessed if you suffer. And this is where I think sometimes we mess up, okay? We're thinking because we went through a little suffering that God is obligated not to bless us. That's not where we are blessed. Everybody goes through hard times. Everybody's having a hard time. You're not the only one who's having a difficult time. As a matter of fact, you'd be surprised at how hard of a time most people around you are having. The, the issue is not I am blessed because I'm suffering. The issue is I am blessed if I am suffering for righteousness' sake. That's where the blessing comes from. He says, don't be afraid of the threats. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And then he says this, always be prepared. Always be prepared for what? To defend, to give an answer to anyone who asks of you the reason of the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, with a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed. In other words, they may have to lie about you because that's all they can do. That's what the news article is doing. It is lying against Christianity because that's all that can come up against us. The truth will stand the test of accusation. If we would look at this article and respond as Jesus would respond, I think Jesus would say, pray for your enemies. Bless them and curse not. Because I haven't seen anybody who has been won over by a heated argument. They are won over by our love. We must understand the hope that resides within us as we are responding to this. We have an answer. We have a response. But you won't win an argument and win a convert. You win a convert by loving them as Christ loved them. So how do I get empowered for this? How do I prepare myself to rightly respond when critics come against me, when stress comes against me? How am I supposed to act as a Christian? Part of gathering together on Sunday morning and throughout the week is as we are gathering together, we remember, we remember the Sabbath, right, to keep it holy, one of the Ten Commandments. We are recognizing the holiness of God as we gather together. They've done a survey to find out why it is that young people stay in church. You know, we always say, well, why did they drop out? You know, why, why did they say? 
when they graduate from high school, 80% will drop out. What about the 20% who don't drop out? And, and others will come, you know, when they get married, they start having the kids, they say, well, maybe we better get back to church, right? But there's this time frame, post-adolescence, in which young people feel the need to withdraw from church and withdraw from the faith of their fathers, right? Well, why is that? Why, why does that happen? Or more importantly, why do some people stay? Those who have stayed has some common factors. Number, number one, they had a genuine, a bona fide conversion experience. In other words, they didn't just pray a little prayer and say, okay, I'm okay. They had a genuine conversion experience. By the way, we also know from working with those who are offenders, those who are incarcerated, those who come out and stay out, 83% of them who do not go back into prison don't go back into prison because they had a genuine conversion experience. It wasn't jailhouse religion. It wasn't, I embrace this faith because my mom and dad have this faith, and because they have this faith, I'll take this faith. That faith will not stand the test of pressure. As soon as you get out from that, you're, you're gone. But if you have a genuine conversion experience, then it's a whole different story. The second factor they found in those who do not leave church is they felt like they were connected as a family, and they felt the presence of God when they came to worship. In other words, they didn't just come to worship because they had to. Uh, they weren't just coming and checking out. Uh, they were coming, and they were connected, and they said, you know what, there's something different about gathering together here. The presence of God is here. They sensed that. They felt that. They knew that, and they realized, i got to stay connected with that. And then thirdly, those who stayed connected were those who were empowered to serve serve within the church. They said, you know what, I'm, a, I'm part of the family. The church needs me. I'm equipped to serve. I've got to be serving within the church. So, so get in there, as, as Rick challenged us last week, and don't be an armchair quarterback. Be part of what God is doing. In Psalm 50, verse 5, it says, Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Okay, gather together, and, and David says, this is going to cost you something, right? But it's worth it. Those who are most connected, most empowered, strengthened in their faith, are those who are not just receiving the free gift of salvation, but are giving back. So this morning, I want to quickly give you seven benefits of gathering. Okay, I'll, I'll give them to you real quick because time is already sliding by on us. And maybe you're saying, well, you know, why should, it doesn't really matter. It's, the devil feeds us these little lies. And, and, and if we're not on top of it, we, we believe it. And, and a lie that is repeated over and over and over again becomes the truth for you. You know, the devil says, well, you know, you don't really have to go to church. I mean, you don't have to be there every time the doors are open, do you? Well, why not? That has been repeated over and over again so much in our culture. Now we believe it's true. We don't have to go to church every time the doors are open. In other words, you don't have to be faithful in gathering. Who brought, brought this into the, the realm of thing, things? Where do you find this scripturally? But, but it's been repeated so long, we think that that is now found in the Bible somewhere. I don't find it. I find just the opposite. I find don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Because the enemy knows something that we don't know when we say things like you don't have to come every time the doors are opened. The enemy knows, right, that if we don't come, the less we come, the less likely we are to return. And the longer we go without coming, the harder it is to come back. So don't stop coming. So, so here are seven benefits, okay, of gathering together to worship. Number one, I'm in on God's purpose. Listen, God has a purpose for everything. Paul uses an illustration to drive home God's purpose of us gathering together. And he uses the illustration of marriage. And a good way to see if you are gathering faithfully as you ought to be is you ask yourself this simple question. Is if I were as faithful in gathering as I am as faithful to my wife, all right, what kind of marriage would I have? What kind of relationship with Christ would I have? Now, now this is an argument is not my, my, my mindset, okay? This is not my thoughts. This is the Apostle Paul. Paul makes it very clear. He says the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, 
He himself being the Savior of the body. Now, we don't have time to, to go through the rest of this, but he makes this, this parallel comparison between marriage and the church. Christ being the head of the church, the husband being the head of the house. And this is what the problem that we have, men, okay? We're not the head of our house, and so we have a hard time letting Christ be the head of the church because we learn to be the head of the house when Christ is the head of our lives. And that's where the difficulty comes in for men. Because we want to be the head, but we don't want to be the head. We want it, but we don't want it. In other words, we, we like to say, I'm in charge. I provide the leadership, but we don't want to provide the leadership. So if we look at God's purpose, when we gather together, if you look at the beginning of this chapter 5, let me kind of paraphrase what happens in the previous verses in Ephesians chapter 5. Light makes everything visible, right? It wakes us up in the morning. Light has that ability to wake us up spiritually. You are dead in your trespasses and your sins. God reveals his light to you. God is light, and where there is light, there is life. And because of the life that we now have, we got to walk carefully. The old King James Version is, we've got to walk circumspectly. Okay, and I, I'm not sure that you woke up this morning and said, honey, we're going to walk circumspectly today. I'm sure you said that to your wife when you woke up this morning, okay? It means you walk with precision, realizing that as you walk, you have been given this tremendous gift of life. Not just everlasting life, but a powerful life here on this earth. And Paul drives it home. Just in case you don't get it, okay? In case you're missing it, don't get drunk with wine, right? You know what wine does to you when you have too much of it? It controls you instead of you controlling it. He says, but instead, be filled, constantly being filled, you know, with the Holy Spirit. And as you're doing that, you are surrendered to Christ. You're also surrendered to each other. And then he goes into the home aspect. He says, if this is happening, right? If this is happening, then the husband provides the leadership that he needs to his wife, and they together, together, surrender to Christ. In the home, the husband provides the leadership as he submits to Christ, who is the head of the church. The church submits to Christ, who is the head of the church. So it drives home that theme, not me, but he. Christ takes preeminence as I surrender to him. My wife has no trouble whatsoever surrendering to me because we are both surrendered to Christ. The last verse in chapter 5 talks about mutual submission. Husbands and wives submitting to one another under the lordship of Christ. So, so the first benefit as we are gathering together, right, and we come together, is we're tying in on God's purpose, not only for the church, but for our lives. Now, I could go on and share more with you, but time will not allow us to do that. But this is what I've discovered. The less we gather, the less clearly we understand God's purpose for our lives. The, the less we gather, the more we lean on our own understanding to figure things out. Here's the second benefit of gathering. Not only am I in on the, the purpose of God, but number two, I'm in on the, the presence of God and the will of God. Matthew 18. Yeah, we love this verse, okay? And again I say, if two or three of you gather in my name and you ask anything, it will be done by my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I among you. Now, as we look at this verse, a lot of times this has been wrongly interpreted. There's, there's one interpretation of Scripture, many applications, okay? As we look at this passage of Scripture, we've got to realize that this is in the context of discipline, okay? As, as we're gathering together, we're entering into God's presence, but we're also following His will. The reason it is hard for you to gather into God's presence when you're out of sync is because you're going to be reminded that you're out of sync. 
it's easier to stay home than to be reminded that my life is not where it needs to be. But in the long term, you begin to drift out of the will of God. There is safety as we gather in His name. Now I'm going to give you an Old Testament passage that I, that I that hope I won't lose you on it, okay? I hope we won't lose where I'm going with this, okay? In, in Numbers chapter 7, you don't have to turn there, Moses does something. In Numbers chapter 7, he goes and he enters into the tent of the meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and he goes in there for the purpose of meeting the Lord. As he exits the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory of God is shining. Okay? With time, they couldn't even look at Moses. Okay, they had to put a veil over his head. With time, right, that, that shining begins to diminish. Moses had to go back in, right, to the temple to have that Shekinah glory revealed again. As we come into the New Testament, the presence of the glory of God is our inheritance, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. This is why our hearts know and experience more of Him. So, so when we gather together, right, like we're doing this morning, and we sing worship praises to God and we praise His holy name, and we are exhorted by the Word, we're actually entering into the, the presence of God, and as the Word is being proclaimed, the Shekinah glory is being spread, and we're to follow God's will. As we get out, we tend to diminish that glory. As, as Moses' glory was diminished, that, that tends to happen. We, we tend to be depleted, and so we come back together for exhortation, for encouragement, not only to be encouraged, but I think more importantly, to encourage others. And we follow in the will of God. When worship services are worshipful, people are meeting God, and they participate in that together. together. This is a major benefit of worshiping God as we gather together. I'm in on His presence. I'm in on His will. You are less likely to fall out of the will of God if you are staying connected in a worship experience, because you cannot constantly come into his presence. You know, our hearts are so desperately wicked. Who can know them, right? And, and I'm strong on a personal devotional life. Every day, you ought to spend time in God's word. You ought to spend time in prayer. But if your time in prayer and in God's word doesn't drive you to the importance of gathering together with other believers, Something is missing in your quiet time. You're missing the bigger picture. You're turning it in instead of turning it out. And when we gather together, we are reminded every week that this thing is much bigger than me. It's not just about me hunkering down and having my little quiet time. And, and I love that. I'm not against that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But that cannot take the place of corporate worship because you can think you're much more spiritual than you are because you had a quiet time when it is flushed out when we are gathered together with other people. You know, I can be real spiritual if I don't have to deal with anybody. Yeah, yeah, that's easy. I can be like the spiritual giant if nobody messes with me. And, and that's where many Christians are. We'll have my little quiet time, and then I'm going to come out of my quiet time, I'm going to live like the devil. Because I have my little quiet time. I'm spiritual. What? You be, I think you're better off not having that kind of quiet time because it hasn't equipped you to be salt and to be light. It hasn't equipped you to be a blessing to somebody else. Well, let me move on, okay? It's getting kind of quiet in here. It makes me a little nervous, okay? All right, here's the third benefit of gathering together. When I gather together, I'm in on God's power. Yeah, I'm on... They devoted themselves, Acts chapter 2, uh, the early church, just days after the Pentecost, right? Just days after the establishment of the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Get this next little phrase. And, and awe 
came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. One Sunday morning, a pastor was preparing to go to lead his church in worship, and he was listening on a television program to a church service. The minister on the television service said, it's Easter, and it doesn't even make a difference if Christ has risen or not. Shocked, this pastor, A.H. Huckley, shouted, it's a lie. He is risen. His wife said, well, why don't you write a song about it then? Reading the gospel accounts again, and feeling God's presence, he began writing, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. As we gather together, breaking bread and fellowshipping together and worshiping together, we are tapping into a powerful source. We are tapping into God's power. So many Christians, and it grieves my heart to say this, have no idea of the power that God has given them. It reminds me of the story of Mr. Yates' pool. Mr. Yates was a poor man who had property in Texas. He was a poor farmer who was struggling to pay the payment on his land. What he did not know, that when he had bought that parcel of land, he had bought the rights, the mineral rights, to everything that was on that property. One day, a company came by. They did some exploration on his property and discovered that just below the surface, about 135 feet below the surface, there was an oil reserve. They dug down deeper to 1,000 feet and discovered that this man had humongous reserves of oil just below the surface of his property. It was producing 125,000 barrels of oil every day. Yates owned it all, but he didn't know it until he dug deep and found the reservoir of wealth. When we gather together, we are digging into God's Word, and we discover there is tremendous power in gathering together. Peter put it this way, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he will lift you up in due time. Cast all your care upon him, because he cares for you. This morning, if you have come with a heavy burden, right? I want to tell you that the power of God is just below the surface. If you'll cast your care upon him, he will empower you. He will give you the strength to move on in a powerful fashion. Here is the next point. When we gather together, man, we are in on God's power and his provision. Going again in Acts chapter 2, driving down to verse number 44. All who believed were together. They had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. God's provision. Everybody provided for. But, but notice how it's done. We always say, me first. The early church didn't say, me first. They gave first. They put God first. I mean, this is a biblical principle. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things are added to you. This week I had the opportunity of spending some time with my family and spent uh, 24 hours in, in a vehicle with seven of us. Wow, that was fun. Driving up the East Coast into Massachusetts, and as I was driving up, 
there was a few minutes that it was actually quiet in my vehicle. And I was thinking about, you know, gathering together a family and doing stuff together as a family. My dad, every year, would gather us together. There were seven of us kids, put us in the back of a Plymouth station wagon, and we would drive up to New Brunswick, Canada. And every year we would go, usually for a week in July, and we would go up during the hay harvest time, and it would help my uncle, who was a cattle farmer. I had two uncles, one that uh, had Hereford ca cattle, one who had dairy cattle, and so our job, our vacation was going up there and harvesting hay, throwing it in the back of a wagon, throwing it into a barn. And we always stayed at a place that was a family farm, and they just called it the lower place, for lack of a better term. It was down, and uh, it's a really hilly area, down by a river. And uh, it was one of these no-frills types of places. It had electricity, but very little electricity. It had an outhouse, and it had a well. I've got a picture on the next slide of what this well kind of looked like. I didn't get the exact replication of it. Uh, but many of you are maybe old enough to remember having to go out there and prime the pump. You, you first had to put the water into the pump before you could get water out of it. And if you were foolish, when you were done and didn't set aside at least a gallon of water, the next person behind you couldn't get any water. And I remember going to this place, and we'd go down there, and we're thinking, well, what are we going to do? And how are we going to... Somebody always left a bucket of water, thinking ahead, so that we could use it to prime the pump. There's always a note inside the house saying, don't forget to leave a bucket of water so others can enjoy the benefit of this water. The same is true when it comes to God's provision. And this is where I think we struggle. We go and say, I have nothing to give, but I need God's provision. you got to prime the pump. That's what the New Testament church did. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given. He didn't say, get, and then you give. He says, give, and you will be given. I mean, he already set the ball in motion by giving us salvation. When that happens, we become a new creation in Christ. Now he says, okay, you've got to give. You can't just absorb. You can't just be a, a taker. If you want more of my provisions, you must pass those provisions on. When we don't pass those provisions on, we dam up God's blessings. And that's what we do. We say, okay, God, no longer will you bless me because I'm, I'm hoarding your blessings. If you want God's provisions, as we gather together, we were reminded what God did for us, and we give back. We give back through our time. Some of you are real tightwads with your time, right? Be generous with your time. You don't, you don't have enough time. Give more of your time. Give your talents. Every one of you have a talent that could be used. Give of your treasures. Listen, some people give a lot more than others. We're not everybody to give the same. Never have been about everybody giving the same. It's all about equal sacrifice. For you, that may be $5. It may be $10. For some of you, writing a check of $1,000 is really not a sacrifice. You think it is, because you want to give it away, right? But, but it's really not. You have that capacity to give, and, and I have found an incredible thing happens. You tap into God's provision when he learns that he can trust you with it. He will never give you more than he can trust you with, whether that be financial blessings or spiritual resources or his power. He never gives you more than he can trust you to manage. And a good steward of everything that has been given to us must be passed on. Some of you could be much better leaders, but the reason you're not a very good leader is because you're sissified. Yes, every little excuse you've used to quit. Stop your nonsense. God doesn't use quitters. Stop your quitting. Why don't you quit quitting? Make that your New Year's resolution, right? And some of us have even put a spiritual twist to this thing, right? 
We try to put a spiritual spin on quitting. What? Have you lost your mind? We quit when we die. That's when we finish the course that God has set for us. Okay, now some of you may say, well, the preacher's done gone from preaching to meddling. He's meddling in my life. So let's move on, okay? As we gather together, we are also recipients of God's protection. Gathering together, we are protected. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Okay, Peter, Petra, small rock. Upon this rock, Petras, is Christ. Don't confuse these two like our Catholic brothers do or friends do. All right? As you look at this verse, it's very clear that the church is not built upon Peter. It's built upon Christ. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And what happens? When you're in this rock, when you're in this church, the gates of hell, it doesn't say it won't come against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's going to come against it, right? But it won't prevail. When, when you separate yourself from the church, and you're out there in no man's land, right? You forfeit this protection. You don't even know you have forfeited this protection. That's why it's so dangerous. It doesn't say that the gates of hell won't prevail against you as a person. It talks about the corporate gathering of Christians. That's where your safety is. That's why I'm staying in the, in the church. Because that's where I'm under God's umbrella of protection. When, when I step out of that, I lose that protection. Listen, great men of God have always understood this fact. Billy Graham was voted for, I think, the 58th time on the top 10 of America's most admired men. 58 times. I mean, that's phenomenal, okay? Billy Graham, when he was doing his crusades, would never come into a community unless at least 300 churches would support him. Let me say, yeah, yeah, he wanted them to follow up on them. Yeah, that's true. That's part of it. But he understood something even far greater than that. He says, I am under the protection of these churches as I exercise my gift of evangelism. If I don't have their protection, my ministry's over. He understood that. Why don't we understand that now? Why, why do we miss this? That we really don't need to be committed to anything, right? I think I'm going to go to this church this week and maybe that church next week because I'm still going to church. But where's your protection? Where do you really belong? Where you a member, right? Where's your protection? I mean, is that pastor that you're bouncing around every different church, is that pastor going to help you? He doesn't even know who you are. Right? You, you get hooked in. It's like me saying to my wife, say, hey, honey, I really do love you. And, and I tell you what, I come with you Monday nights. Tuesday nights, I got somebody else. Wednesday night, I got somebody else. But I love you, honey, man, I'm with you. Will you come visit me if I go in the hospital? You know what my wife will say? I won't tell you what she'll say. The last point. I'm sorry, two more points. We'll, we'll give them to you real quick because time is going by. I'm in on God's peace. For God is not the author of confusion. The absence of peace always leads to confusion. Where there is confusion, there is not God. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the saints. Now, why does Paul have to add that little phrase there? Because that phrase is pivotal to understanding this passage. If you want God's peace, you are part of the church. In this case, he's writing, writing to a specific church, the church at Corinth. And he says, if you guys want to avoid confusion, right, Stay within God's peace as God is in the church that brings about peace. That's why we do everything decently and in order to the very best of our ability, okay? We're, we're humans and we mess up often. But to the best of our ability as we gather together, we try to have a reason for it, peace behind it. 
And we try to experience God's peace that passes all understanding. Number seven. By gathering together, I'm in on God's directions, God's, God's plans. And, and he puts all things in subject under his feet, and he gave him as head over all of the things to the churches. What's Paul saying here? Paul's saying that everything falls under Christ, and he gets very specific that Christ is head over the church. That's God's, God's plan for the church. A.W. Tozer talks about, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but talks about why is it that churches are perishing and not vibrant? And he says, the world is perishing for lack of knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for, what, for want of his presence. The instant cure of most of our religious ills would be to enter into the presence of a spiritual experience to become suddenly aware that we are in God's presence and that God is in us. This would lift us out of our pitiful narrowness and cause our hearts to be enlarged. This would burn away any impurities from our lives as the bugs and the fungi were burned away by the fire that dwelt in that bush. In on God's plans. As you look at this next slide, and then I'll give you our three promises, and then we'll wrap it up, okay? My wife posted this on Facebook. I don't know where she got it from. Passed it along from somebody else. How did Jesus gain disciples? Jesus didn't say, well, well just listen to me, right? Instead, he said, come and see. That's what the gathering is all about. Come and see what God is doing. Jesus showed them where he stayed. That's small group ministry, right? If you're not in a small group, you're hurting yourself spiritually and you're robbing a blessing from somebody that you could be an encouragement to. Yeah, if there's, if there's only two benefits that you want out of, get, out of small group, number one, you get a blessing. Number two, you are a blessing. Most of you are anyway. There's a few of you. Extra grace required, okay? I'm not sure you're a blessing to your small group, but they pour your, their life into you and they try to encourage you, okay? That's a very small percentage. But every one of us can be a blessing. Jesus showed them. He invited them into his life, demonstrated the gospel in action. This is how he won the disciples over. He, he didn't sit down with them and say, come and listen to me. He said, follow me. Yeah, follow me. If I were to follow you around all week, would there be any disciples following you? Would anybody be impacted by you spiritually? I think a lot of us are taking a walk, right? Nobody's really following us. But we're thinking we're, dis we're making disciples. No, we've got to be pouring ourselves into others, okay? So here are my three promises to you. Number one, Number one, I will love you authentic, authentically. Not, I use that word authentically, okay? True love doesn't hide the truth. True love admits when it's wrong. If you want a, a great passage on what love is all about, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I will love you authentically. And, and by doing that, there are times when I'm going to say, hey, you know what, I really messed up, guys. Yeah, we did something we probably shouldn't have done, but at the time we thought it was the right thing to do, and so, hey, I'm sorry I messed up, okay? That's what authentic love is all about. And uh, men, uh, never be afraid to do that, okay? Never be afraid to apologize to your wife or your husband or your children. You'd be surprised at the reaction you get when you say, oh, I'm sorry, man, you know, you're right, I messed up. People aren't ready for that. They're ready if you get all defensive, right? Get a spar, actually. They don't know how to respond. They say, oh, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry. Yeah, when we mess up, we fess up and we go on, all right? That's what authentic love is all about. But we also will confront, right? When you love somebody and they're doing something really stupid, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to let it go, you know, because I'm afraid to confront that thing. That's not love. That's selfishness. You don't want to confront somebody because it's going to make you uncomfortable in confronting them. That's selfishness. 
An unselfish lover says, you know, I'm going to practice Galatians 6.1. If I see a brother who is caught up in a sin, I'm going to go to him humbly, right? Considering myself, lest I also fall. Now, that's what genuine love is. And if you've never had anybody genuine and love you like that, you're missing out on a big portion of what love is all about. Number two, I will feed you biblically. The Word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than a double-edged sword. Now, when you think about being fed biblically, I mean, how many times have you heard people say, well, I wasn't getting fed. Oftentimes, what they're really saying is, it was hitting too close to home. Jesus gathered his disciples together in John chapter 21, and he says to Peter, hey, Peter, <laughs> do you love me? Yeah, yeah, you know I love you. Feed my lambs, all right? Peter, if you really love me, you love me authentically, you're going to feed my lambs. You're going to pass on, and lambs are baby sheep, right? You're going to pass on that to those who are young in the faith. Jesus asked him again, hey, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you, okay? Feed my sheep. Right, we're taking it to a new level here. Okay, growing in that. Really, but don't forget to feed people, okay? Give them the word, right? When we think about giving people the word, we expound on the word. That is, we're giving you the word. We're saying, this is what the word says. This is, this is the interpretation of that word. And now this is the application of this word. That's what I'm promising to give to you in 2015. Not regurgitated sermons that you can find on the internet, right? I'm talking about getting into the Word so I can feed myself, and from that overflow, I can feed you. Here's the third promise. I will lead you spiritually, all right? As we are leading... And as we're moving, I want you to know that our movement is not arbitrary. It's not unthought of. It's not been unprayed about. When we're moving in a particular direction, it may be a difficult direction to go in, but we're not going to back off it. We're, we're not going to be afraid to go that way. And I've tried to surround myself with men of God. We have elders who have the opportunity to be involved in our church spiritually. We have, an 11, we have 11 deacons who commit to, uh, and are involved in the day-to-day -day operations of our church. And we have ministry leaders that are involved in every facet of our church. So as you think about what the future holds, these are three promises that I'm making to you. As you look at your obligation, you have a heavy and a solemn responsibility as a member of Hickory Ridge Community Church, to be involved in gathering and encouraging others to gather. If you see somebody that hasn't been showing up, you know, I feel like I pastor three churches. I have this service, the 11 o'clock service, which is a whole different crowd, and then I have about 300 men in the prison that I pastor. So, so I feel like I have th three churches that I'm pastoring. If you customarily come to this service and you notice that somebody that used to come is not coming, you have an obligation to say, hey, where you been? You always sit in front of me. How come you're not there anymore? A man, I missed you, right? Because this is what happens. By the time I realize that somebody is missing, it might be a month or two before it connects with me. Because I'm really not focused on who is not here. I'm very focused on who is. As I'm giving the message, that is where my focus is. Ministering to the saints, giving you the word, leading you in worship so that you can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, empowering you so that when you leave this place, you're not quite the same. You're filled with the spirit of God and you're ready to go out there and serve him. You're ready to go out to be a blessing to our community. And it's a heavy job to do that. But if you're ready for it, you have nothing to worry about. Always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. All right, Lord, here we are in your presence once again. 
thanking you for the opportunity to be your servant. Thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you. Right now we have that freedom. Lord, I pray that we'll be strong, that we will be building up and being ready for the enemy to come against us. And Lord, as we look at the future, it doesn't look like, unless you supernaturally intervene, it doesn't look like our nation is coming back to you. But we see pockets of your work. We see areas in which you are moving in the lives of people. And in Matthew 24, you say, when the gospel is preached to every nation, then you're coming back. So Lord, help us to be diligent. Help us to be focused on sharing the gospel with our friends, our relatives, our associates, our neighbors, everybody we come in contact with. May we encourage them to come and see what the Lord has done, to gather with us, to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to be empowered, to be in on your plan. And Lord, we're going to trust you to do big things in this new year. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please look up this way. Ushers, I'm going to ask you to come forward to receive the offering at this time. Pastor Eric's going to come and sing us out in just a second as the praise team comes up. If you have not picked up your giving envelopes, please do so as you are leaving this morning. They're in the table in the Family Life Center right before the... Uh, right I realize that I'm not God. So. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tent. That's good. Yeah. I was done. Yeah. <laughs> I realize that I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. I earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him, and that He has the power to help me recover. I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. I openly examine and confess my faults to God, to myself, and to someone I trust. I voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life. And I humbly ask Him to remove my character defects. I evaluate all my relationships. I offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. I reserve daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer. It helps me to know Him and His will for my life. It helps me to gain the power to follow His will. I yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Let's all stand and sing. Lift my voice to praise you. Lift my voice to praise you. A concrete heart will stop me. A concrete Sing like it's the first time. I sing like it's the first time.
us a heart, given us a home, you've given us a heart, given us a home, you've given us a heart, given us a home with you. Hey, yeah. Amen. God bless you. Have a great morning.